Today's reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 through 16. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enroll younger widows, from when their pa- for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and to incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going from house to house, not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. The word of the Lord, please. Well, hey, I bring greetings back from the Slack family in Fresno. Um, whereas if, I know we have the lights off because it is hot here, right? So the, yeah. Okay, if you say so. I'm going to trust you with that one. I hit Fresno during the cold front this week when we had days where the high temperature was as low as 96. So on that day, it rained. So yeah, it was a little ooky. But God is good. So my grandsons also say, tell everybody hi, because I, know, I you, yeah, you tell them uh, tell, say, ask me questions about them, and I tell them that, and they say, really? They said, well, tell them hi, and if you have any more of those Zoom things, um, Papa, we'll, we will uh, we'll, 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 um, photobomb the, the Zoom thing so we can say hi to them. So anyways, they are thinking of you and uh, praying for all of us. I wanted to just share a couple things. This is not our week for an update from the pastoral search team, so I hope Mike and the team will forgive me, but... Uh, a couple things is we did just finish the um, the pastoral search criteria uh, survey, so I have been correlating, collating, synthesizing, whatever it is, I'm I'm scoring it, and we'll have the final results, Lord willing, uh, presented to the pastoral search team tomorrow night, who meets every week here in room 101. Uh, I know that you know I somebody had mentioned they thought that we meet by Zoom all the time, and I thought, well, why did they think that? And then I realized the picture we put up on the website is all of us Zoom. We look like the Brady Bunch kind of there. And so, um, but, but we meet here. Sometimes one person has to meet by Zoom like I did this week, but we're here. Uh, thank you for those who are praying for us. Keep signing up from those prayer slots. So we did that. And then the, um, the pastoral search criteria survey. And then uh, starting the 18th, we'll have, I think, four Sundays where we will redo what we did a year ago, the ministry insight tool to just kind of check and see where we are in regard to one year in uh, to this this whole time in the life of our church to see uh, how we're doing. We suspect that we are not the same as we were. And even though I, when I came here, I loved you guys from the beginning and thought this is one of the greatest churches I've been ever associated with, you know, we should not be the same as we were every year. And after I'm gone and you have the new guy, the new pastor, um, we should always look at that too because God didn't leave us here to be stagnant but to grow. So those are a couple things for you. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, pray before we unpack this passage today. Heavenly Father, we, we do love you today. We would lift up your name. You are holy and perfect. You are mighty and just. You are gracious and benevolent. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. And yet, Lord Jesus, it tells us about you in Hebrews that we do not have a priest who is unfamiliar with our our infirmities, but was tempted in every way as we are. So you are all these things and more. And um, we love you and praise you today, and we would give you your worth. And as we come to you today, um, we confess that uh, we agree with you that we are not perfect. We will be perfected in Christ, but we are not yet as we will be when, when when we meet you in glory. And so, Lord, as we come today, we confess all those things that are on people's hearts and minds right now, the things in our life 
that we need to agree with you about that you did not save us to leave us playing in the mud there and those things that are going on in our lives that we know that would not please you. And we want to be found as people when you, Jesus, when you come back or when you call us home, we want to be found as people who are living for you. So that's our prayer today. We thank you so much, Lord Jesus, that you lived and died and rose again and called us to yourself, all those of us who have been saved. And we thank you that you use us to give the call to others um, that they could be saved. We thank you for your Holy Spirit in us as believers. We thank you for your word, which does not return void. We thank you for the fellowship of believers of the local church and the church throughout the world and throughout time. We thank you that that uh, you are building your rock upon the faith of Jesus Christ, upon the gospel, upon your believers, and you tell us that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, so we thank you for that. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the food on our table, the clothes on our back, the roofs over our head. We thank you for our family, for our friends. We thank you for those that you have us coming in contact with. And we thank you for this time today to be together with you looking at your word as, as all these things are part of our worship and we thank you for the chance to worship and we ask that you help us to worship you with the Holy Spirit that's in us, help our hearts and minds to be focused on you and your word. We thank you to help us to worship with, with, in truth according to your word and according to what is just as, and right and true and holy and so we thank you for your word today. We ask Lord that you help us to have a heart for people who are lost like you do. And if you didn't have that, we, frankly, we wouldn't be saved. And we thank you, Father, that you are so patient with us. And we ask, Father, that you help us to use that fruit of the Spirit to be patient, long-suffering, for, um, bearing, forbearing with one another. We, we, Lord, we lift up our leaders today in this, in this uh, society and ask, as you tell us to do, that that uh, we ask your blessing on them that they would come to know Jesus Christ. And for those who don't know Jesus Christ, we pray that, uh, for those who do know Jesus Christ, we pray, pray that they would live for him. And Father, for all the things right now going on hearts and minds today, we come from places of various things happening in our lives, of sicknesses, of travel, of joy of vacation, of worry about going back to work, from new job, from losing a job, to all these things. And yet you are familiar with our griefs and you are right there with us. And so we ask, Lord, that you help us to not just wait till those things we don't like pass, but we ask today especially that you would help us to live in the time that you have given us and that we would rejoice that this is the day that you have made and that we would be glad in that day and be glad in you. And so help us today to hear your word in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are in uh, 1 Timothy 5, 19, 9 through 16. And uh, just forgive me because if it's a little dark for you, it's darker for me than I'm used to, but that's okay. And uh, maybe it's the fact that I am getting older that makes it darker. I'm not sure. But, but um, we are in number 15 out of 21 today. So by my calculations, that's about 70% through the first book of 1 Timothy. Uh, we're talking about relationships uh, how to treat those who have no family today, particularly, uh, I'll unpack that in a second, about uh, widows. But we are, we are talking about authority and hope for local elders, pastors, for the local church. And with our new pastor in mind, that this would be in line with what the new pastor is like. And also, for us, in, have that in mind, that we would live that way, as our church mission coincides with the Great Commission that we would be loving God by helping people follow Jesus. And if we are doing that perfectly, our vision is then that we would be joined together on this journey with Jesus as we pray, grow, give, and go. I was following yesterday afternoon in the plane, and as we were going, they said, I'm, I, I was kind of following it on this flight thing that, uh, that Gordy Goodsell gave me. I was following my own flight and I had a great fun with my, with my grandsons following these flights as they fly over our backyard. But I was following my own flight, and I saw, wow, we're really getting up there. And then the um, pilot says, on your right, those, and of course I'm sitting on the left, those of you who are by a window, of course I'm in the aisle, but um, <laughs> uh, you can see Mount Rainier. And I thought, well, I can't really, but then I kind of twisted, and I, saw, and I saw Mount Rainier, and I was looking at the flight data, and we were actually lower than the peak of, of Mount Rainier. And it was just, how awesome is our God? 
that he makes these things and that, that everybody wants to ascribe them to, to something else or some other way. But it, it is an awesome thing to see that um, we are on a journey together with Jesus because as we get into the fall semester uh, of, of our intentional discipleship, I want us to be thinking about these classes that Pastor Matt has put together with the help of various leaders and teachers in the churches, these 12-week classes that will help us look at Bible beliefs and behavior, and we'll see we're different places in our discipleship. We could, like we're on a hike together, and there's groups of hikers at the back, in the middle, and at the front, but yet we're all together on this journey with Jesus. And as we dig into 1 Timothy, it's, it's helpful to me to see that this is part of that, as we pray, grow, give, and go, this with widows, it's part of the, the give but it's also we're teaching them about the grow and we're modeling for that and we're, we're coming around together with them as, as sisters and for widowers as brothers in Christ. So if we were just preaching topically, and there's nothing wrong with preaching topically, frankly, it's good, it's all, it's, uh, we're going to be doing some topical thing on prayer in the fall, but it's a lot harder for the, for the preacher to stay true to the word of God when he teaches topically. Because he needs to take, and that's what I'm going to do in the fall, take a passage and exegete it still. That means dig out what it says, what it meant to the, in the original context. And exposit it, that means give out to how then shall we live. And it's really easy on topical sermons to just kind of cherry pick and go all over the place and make the, sing, the word of God sing and dance and stand on its head. And you know, God meant one thing when he said it. And so we're responsible to say that one thing. And so as we look here in context, you think, well, where is he going with this? Well, as we talk about with widows, normally if we were just doing topically and I, I broke out a two-part series on widows, you'd say, well, do we have a problem with widows? The widows or the widowers, have they run amok? What, what's, what's he saying? Well, I try not to ever send those well, you know, subliminal messages. If I thought there was a problem, I, I would hope and pray. I would always speak to it rather than around it. But no, we, we have a great group of widows and widowers, and they've just started meeting together. And I think God's doing a mighty thing there. And we're encouraged, and we want to encourage them as well. But the neat thing about going verse by verse is not the only way to go, but it is, it's a benefit of us today, is you don't have to ask that question, is there a problem? No, this is what we're covering, and God is preparing us for this. As we look at this today, we're seeing, if you looked in, in your outline, it's about, is it about support or enabling for service? And the answer is yes. It's about both. Supporting widows and enabling them for service. Just like we all need some kinds of support, we all need enablement for service. It's also about helping younger widows. There is a thing here that Paul has talked about last week's passage and this week's passage, particularly to do with younger widows. Younger widows, they thought were people under 60 that had lost their, their spouse, lost their husband, and because 60 was considered ancient at that time, and, and, and people might not be able to still work, and it was unlikely that they would get married again. Well, we know today, where I think the old, oldest person in the world today is about 117, we know that uh, 60 is only halfway there, right? And so, uh, but, but at the same time, the principle of younger widows stills apply, and we're supposed to encourage them to find ways, uh, what God wants them to do, and lead them to avoid temptation that comes with the territory. And then lastly, we're supposed to remind the church to take care of our family. And so that's where we're going today. As we look at this, we see as um, slide number one is already up there, is this about support or enabling for service? It says in verse nine, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. So the answer to that question is yes, it's about both. And this is not a laundry list or a, or a uh, uh, prescription of what a widow has to check off all these boxes in order to have a church family when she has no uh, biological family left. It's not the, the checkoff boxes. It's talking about a person who you can see is more Christ-indulgent than they are self-indulgent. And that's a great lesson for all of us, is we, we know that we will either be in, in our lives, in our seasons of life, 
in our years, in our months, in our week, in today, in our hours, in our thoughts, even now, we will either be, as Christians, Christ-indulgent or self-indulgent. Now, if you're here today and you have never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, you know, then, then I, I say this carefully, but we don't expect the same things out of you. Because if you're saved, the Bible says that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, 1 Corinthians 16, 6, 19, and 20. You know, that we're a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us, who we have received from God. And so before that, it's not that we're perfect now. In fact, we still sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, we say we're that without sin, we, we call God a liar and we are lying. So, but what are we saying? We are saying, and there's a little card out there on the foyer, although I'm, I'm pleased to see that we're running out at least on that side. But as the gospel is concerned, and I want you, if you're here today and, you've, um, and you're not a Christian, you've not born again, I want you to be prepared. Most of all, I want you to know the gospel, but we're going to take communion, and the communion is for those who have trusted Christ. And so a way to remember gospel is, gee, that God made us for himself. Genesis 127 says we're made in God's own image. Oh, is our sin got in the way? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, even, the, even our righteousness, the Bible tells us, is as filthy rags. The S of the gospel is that sin can't be gotten rid of by anything we do. We can't unring the bell. Titus 3.5 says it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy that he has saved us. The P of the gospel is paying the price. Jesus died for our sins. Now, there's lots of passages in this, but think of the one you probably all know, even if you're not a believer, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And the E is that everyone who would repent and believe is what the gospel is about. And under that E is, if you will, an ABC. To admit, by believing, it's admit your sins. Believe that Jesus is as he says he is in Scripture. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. It says in John 14, 6, no man comes to the Father except through me. And choose to repent of our sins and say, God, take my life, forgive my sins, come in and fellowship with me, make me wholly yours. The Bible calls that being born again. Being a Christian, and so the gospel, you may have noticed we are only on the gospel, okay? But the L is that person will then live forever. Romans 6, 23 is the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So as we talk about that, we see these things that have to do with widows. There are applications for us as well that we would encourage people and support people. And here he's talking about widows. First he says about enrolling widows. This is putting them on a church list primarily here for financial support. There's other support as well, but these are widows that have no other means of support. Uh, Paul calls them true widows. Now, now don't get us wrong and confuse your 21st century Merriam-Websters with the Bible dictionary, okay? Because in the, in the first century, true widows meant if they were truly alone, not only had their spouse died, but it was like a bad country western song, you know? They had, they had no, no husband, no children, no grandchildren, nobody out there, you know? In, in the country western vernacular, they have no draw, dog and no pickup truck. They have, they have nothing, no, no visible means of support. That's what Paul is talking about with true widows. He's not saying that other widows are not true widows, but he means truly alone. And so that's something that we should take to heart in terms of there are other people in our lives that might be truly alone as well. Are we caring for them? Um, anyways, this, this is the thing for them to say, how do we help who? When he says wife of one husband, it's the same thing. It's the reverse of when we've talked about elders. It's a, a um, husband of one wife. It means literally one man, woman. She's, been, she's devoted to him. doesn't even mean that she wasn't married before and then another husband passed or something happened, but it means that she was faithful to the husband who has, has died and left her to be a widow. And then this to differentiate, who should we, if a church is going to give financial support to widow, how can we steward our resources the best so that we have enough to support them? 
And so 60 years old, again, was ancient in the country uh, at, at that time. She was probably not uh, healthy enough to work, and she was less likely in that culture to remarry. We could say today we wouldn't pick an age. We just know, we just know what these characteristics are. So faithfulness, age, and is she truly an active part of the local body? Has she in the past, and is she now doing the things that women of like situ situation who lived for Jesus were known for doing? It's, it, and it, it goes on to explain this kind of a woman that she has a reputation for good works. You know, I, I think of that phrase, and I think of a whole bunch of faces in this congregation that pop up into my head. If she has brought up children, she doesn't have to have had up children, but if she's brought up children... She's, she's, she's done a good job with them. She may have even helped bring up other people's children, grandchildren. She has shown hospitality. I love the, the, um, the word for hospitality is xenophilia. And philia you probably get is love. Xenos is different. She has shown love for people who are different than her. They're in a different demographic. They're in a different age. They're different than, than what even she might believe. She's still showing them love. Yes, the same things we get about hospitality, inviting somebody into our home or, or helping take care of them. But has she done that? I love wash the feet of the saints. That's, that's other believers. Now, obviously, you know that a lot of times before communion, there would be a time, or during communion service, there would be a time of foot washing. And Jesus talked about foot washing in John 13. But, but what this means, simply, this is a euphemism of that time, a saying that people would have understood and mean is she's been willing to do whatever it takes to serve the body of Christ. She is cared for, not only in what she does, but what she demonstrates how she feels, that she loves the people of God. And she's also cared for the afflicted. Remember, the afflicted were not popular in the first century. They were, you know, it was like, run away, run away. You know, <laughs> leprosy, leprosy. She's cared for the afflicted, and she has devoted herself to every good work. So again, I just want to make sure we understand as we unpack this list that this is not prescriptive. This is not, okay, woman, wife of one husband, check. Have good reputation, check. Brought up children, check. No, this is, this is generally what her woman, what her life is like. And this is somebody who said, you know what? We, we only have, at Church at Ephesus, we only have so much money to take care of so many people. We want to make sure we're taking care of people who, who can't serve or can't, can't take care of themselves. And they have nobody around them to take care of them as well. And so this, this is what this is talking about. And then slide number two, help younger widows also. Now this would be under the under 60 crowd, probably in our day and age, there are still people, there are still women working at 60. Um, my, my wife, I know, is still working at 60. Thankfully, she was not a widow. Okay, that was, and uh, at least I'm very thankful for that. And, um, but, but had I passed, even now, my wife would be considered a, a younger widow. Uh, would she be able to take care of herself? You know, he says, uh, but refuse to enroll younger widows. Why? Well, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. Now, part of that is, is he doesn't say if their passions draw them away from Christ. He says when. And that means that everybody is drawn to some extent by their passions. But remember, Paul has talked before in 1 Corinthians about the value of those called to a single life. And so here he's saying, you know, why were they called the passion? Why, were they, why was he talking about the value of singleness for some people, the, the dreaded gift of singleness, which is another sermon another day? Uh, which is, because it's not supposed to be dreaded. God says that, that he has made people for, in certain times in their life for certain things, but if they might be called to be married again, Paul says, we want to be allowed for that. We don't want to trip everybody up. We won't want them to have to pretend that they don't desire to get married again. We, we want to do everything to support them physically, but also spiritually, encouraging them. And so, so it says, um, when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, 
They learn to be idlers going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gospelers and busybodies saying what they should not. And so what, is, what does he mean by this? He means that they need encouragement. Now, we all need encouragement, but they need, in this, uh, the next slide, A, encourage them to find out what God wants them to do. I think there's another slide there. It's A. There we go. No. Oh, that's the rest of the scripture. Okay, so I would have younger women, Mary. Okay, you've got that. We'll just go with A. Encourage them to find out what God wants them to do. Sorry about that slide, folks. That's my fault. And so the church wanted to encourage people to serve Jesus while they were still able to, to avoid charges of laziness. Now, what this is all about, is this about, you know, get right or get left, turn or burn, all of these things? No, this is about the Christian life is lived to authenticate the gospel. The way we are living, the way we are talking, either to the, to the world, to our loved ones also, to the people around us, it either gives more evidence that what Jesus was was true, what God said is true, or it's evidence that flies in the face of that. So he's saying, you know, sometimes widows, they may have a lot of free time, especially if the church is supporting them. So we want to make sure that nobody can lay a charge against them. We know that deep down, if they've trusted Jesus, they want to be a witness. They want their life to authenticate the gospel. And so we want to help them. We want to come alongside them and help them in that, to encourage them to do what God wants them to do. Um, and to make sure that they manage resources, to, the church wanted to still be able to help other needle, needy people in the church. Now, older widows, as a group, they found were more likely to be both needy and willing to serve at the same time. Remember I talked last week about visiting some older widows, and I said, you know, what do they say to me? What they, and that's not, like, exhaustive. That's just anecdotal. But, but it's almost my universal experience when I would visit a, an older widow not living with her family who's a believer. She'll say, I don't know why God still has me here. I just want to go home. What do you think God is doing by leaving me here? Why would God leave me here? And I'll say, well, you know, it's a good reason if he left you here. And you can pray. That is one thing you can do because we need more people who pray more for more people. You can, even as you visit with people, you can witness. There are things that you can do, and God knows. God is the one who brought you into the world. He's going to be the one who takes you out of the world. In the meantime, we are to occupy until he comes, if you will. And so remember the church in Ephesus had a lot of people who professed Christ, but they worked against the gospel. They worked against and said bad words, maybe not out loud so everybody could hear them all the time, but whisper, whisper, whisper. Go from like a bee from flower to flower to flower and say, not even say directly bad things, but don't you think? Haven't you heard? What do you think? All those kind of things to cast aspersions on people. And they might think that they're doing good, but they are de-authenticating the gospel in the eyes of the world. And so Paul is saying, let's button that up. There are people who profess Christ and work against the gospel. They work against unity. People, quite frankly, in the church, the, Paul, Timothy, the other Bible teaching elders who had not turned to uh, asceticism, which is like seeing you could be saved by what you get up, give up, or Gnosticism, and say, well, you have a special knowledge that goes beyond salvation. People had not fallen to that. Paul and Timothy and them, what they wanted to make sure that they were enabling them to live for Jesus and not the other way around. And they wanted to add to the list, supportive list of widows. They wanted to be careful about adding widows who were still young enough to remarry because some young widows who remarried and, and not needing support became pretty brazen in flaunting their newfound lack of need for God's church. Again, the tension is not about whether they remarry or not, but it's about what? Self-indulgence versus Christ indulgence. We can virtually measure every thought we have and every word we say and everything in our, in our schedule by is it self-indulgent or is it Christ-indulgent? And, and it comes back to say, you know, sometimes we might say, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, you want know, to do this. And say, does God have the best for you in mind or not? Is he truly the father of lights, it says 
in James chapter, er, in James, who is he's the father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Is he truly the giver of every good and perfect gift? Or am I the giver of my own every good and perfect gifts? And so, in addition, he wants to, and this is a B under there, it's already up, lead them to avoid the temptations that come with the territory. If you never see anybody that is having trouble with temptation, or you never see anybody fall to temptation, does it mean that they are not having trouble or they're not falling? No. It means they're really good at hiding it. And the same thing can be said of you and me. If we never confess our faults to one another, if we never say, hey, I need your help, pray for me about this, I, or say, would you please call me on this? If I just go too crazy about the Giants or the 49ers or whatnot, would you call me on that? I, I'm being facetious. It would be something maybe more serious than that. But you get the idea. If I never do it, I am ostensibly, implicitly saying to you that I am perfect. And I am not. And so if you don't know any of my sins, I encourage you to ask me. But I think you've known me for a year. You could probably make your own list. And so Paul is saying, we just want to help these ladies. That somebody comes along. So not only do they not have somebody to help them financially, but they may not have somebody to help them in their walk with God on a day-to-day -day basis. And for younger widows, they might be okay financially, but we need to help them avoid the temptations that come with the territory. So Paul, Timothy, the other elders that were living for Jesus at that time, they wanted to encourage Christian character. The younger widows in this case, supported by the church and with a track record or history of a lack of desire to serve God's church, may have had too much time on their hands. Sometimes even in Christian circles, when people are desiring certain things in life, coupled with lots of free time, what do we call that? discretionary time. I, we would be far better off if all our time was at God's discretion, but that's maybe another story for another day. But what they were doing was spreading things which are hurtful and going from person to person and saying things which, true or not, were hurtful and which did not help unity in the body or present the church with the purpose of showing Jesus at work in the miraculous, transformative life of sinners saved by grace. Let me say something about that miraculous transformation. People will need to see our sins and see our stumbles and see our falls and see our getting back up because otherwise they don't see Jesus. If Jesus is not transforming our lives, why should they take Jesus on? Because they know they need transforming. So we've got to be, to be humble enough to share those things with one another. And that's, Paul is talking about that here with younger widows. It's not because I'm mad at you or because I'm worried that you're, you know, just bad. It's because I don't want you to lose your witness. I don't want you to get into trouble. And so um, if you couple a lack of humble service with lots of free time and dissatisfaction and lots of pointless interaction and people pointedly saying things that they should not say, that's a perfect storm. For things, for disauthenticating witness and for also for a person themselves stumbling into things which hurt them. Would you turn with me to James 3, 2 through 5? Now Paul has just finished talking about how people, not many should become teachers and then he's going into the why. But then he talks about things which are applicable to us all in James 3 starting at verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they will obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. They are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder whenever the will of the pilot, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also is the tongue a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest fire is set ablaze by a small fire. And there was a sister church I just got an email from yesterday that they had a small fuse box by, a, uh, um, by, a, by their air conditioning unit burst into flames. 
And then uh, it didn't burn down the whole building. It's a church that seats like 1,500. And, and uh, it didn't burn down the whole building, but the sprinklers, to put it out, did a lot of damage. See, aren't you glad we don't have sprinklers? No, that's, sorry, fire people. Okay, I know that's not good. But, but he talks about how damaging things can be. He says, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of hell and set on, excuse me, the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does the spring forth, pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. The reason we say this and the reason we look at this passage here is because Paul has been talking about people going from house to house. Rather than busying themselves with prayer and good deeds, as godly widows had done, some were spending their free time going from house to house. People have speculated on what this idleness might look like in detail, but it does not say what that is. Someone thought they were doing this because since they were supported by the church, under the, they were doing something under the guise of pastoral visits. They speculated that, but that's what it is, just speculation. The idea is that there's nothing here but idleness, pretending they were active for God, but just going where they wanted and not really accomplishing anything for the ministry. Then they were free agents who freely sought their own desire and freely caused a whole lot of satisfy, unsatisfying conversation. And so in light of that, then Paul says, so, in verse 14, or therefore. He suggests there are more you know, alternative actions. And before we got all, all upset about this or thinking, oh, that Paul, he just doesn't like women. That is not true. And remember that this, he's, he's, he's loving women here. And remember that this is God's word. And God made women. So we are trusting in that. And he's saying one thing they could do is a three-parter if they, to see if God is calling them to remarry. And if he is, to remarry, to have children, and again care for a household. But they don't have to do that. They could be, they could do three other things to occupy their time. They could be prayer warriors. They could serve the needs of the local church in love and good deeds. And they could even care for younger women even younger than them, by, by teaching them by word and needs. The point is, if they didn't fill their lives with Christ-indulgent things, Paul is concerned, and he tells Timothy, this is a thing, that they can fill their lives with self-indulgent things. And this is true for widows, but it's also true for all of us. So how can they tell what to do? You know, the difference in telling, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 23, if you want to beat me there, okay? But the difference is basic, it's this. Am I constantly asking God and people for permission? Would it be okay if I did this? God, would it be if, okay? If it'd be okay, God, I'd like to do this. Would it be okay? Or am I asking God, what could I do that would most benefit your kingdom? What can I do, God, that would be most excellent? What can I do, God, that is that you put me here on this planet to do with my time, with my talent, with my treasure, with my resources? With the people among whom you have placed me, what could I do? Because I can do all kinds of things, and I'd say, well, you know what, that's okay. Isn't it okay? It's okay. It's not a big deal. It's a you know, different kind of issue. But 1 Corinthians 10.23 says, all things are lawful. That sounds good, right? But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful. But... Not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And so Paul in that controversy, he's in this particular passage of 1 Corinthians 10, he's talking about eat meat, eating meat offered to idols. But he's saying, people want to know, is it okay? Is it okay? And God says, rather ask, what would be best? 
What would be best? What would be most in line with all the principles of the word of God that you know and in the life God has placed you in? What would be best? What would be most profitable for your kingdom, God? And that's what's needed here. What would be most profitable for the kingdom in the directions of and provisions for those older and younger widows? Now, the part of this that really sticks out, it starts in 14 where Paul says, Timothy and the elders uh, are supposed to help the widows live so that nobody can slander them. They're supposed to be protecting the widows so that the widows can be shown to be above reproach, so that people from other, uh, other faiths and other places and people that don't yet know Jesus would see, wow, God's using them in that way. He can use me. And he says, then it says in verse 15, for some have already strayed after Satan. That's like a bucket of cold water in the face, isn't it? For some have already strayed after Satan. Now, John MacArthur says this could be as simple as in their flitting around, they met and married a non-Christian, you know, and it, and it could be uh, something as where Mounts suggests that in their free time and idle conversation with those heresies of asceticism, that's self-denial saving you, which is not scriptural, or agnosticism, you have knowledge that's better than what God has given you, also anti-scriptural. But with those flying around, maybe they had bought into that. And, um, or maybe they um, you know, said, okay, well, I'm better because I'm not married. Or maybe they said, I'm better because I am married. Or because I don't eat certain foods. Or because I do eat certain foods. Or that, they're, that only devout Jews can be saved, which was going around at Ephesus. He's just talking in any event about some of the younger widows who are not willing to live in harmony with Scripture and the church. And they were adding to dissension in a place already where there's Ephesian church would say, we don't need any more drama. And they were, they were causing drama. Paul then, in true Jewish fashion, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with this, but in Jewish teaching and Greek teaching, the two, the two ways of doing things, constructing things, are systematically different. In Greek teaching, you build step by step by step by step, therefore, wapo, okay? In Jewish teaching, you get to the wapo part, okay? Not wacko, I hope you understood that. You get to the, the punchline, if you will, but you go in circles and say, okay, we got this, got it. Go up a little bit more, we go in circles. Okay, got this, got it. Go up, and, and we eventually get there. So Paul circles back now in, in his Jewish method of teaching, and that's slide number three, where we say they remind the church to care for their own relatives. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. So his primary care is that he wanted to take care of and discern which widows the church would need to financially support because they had nothing else. And then in the process, some it's, it's been historic all the way back into the book of Acts where some widows were saying, oh, we're not taken care of properly. And they complain and there's a disunity of of sorts. The church should have a good relationship with all the widows, but if you're going to physically provide for their support, it's for people who are truly needy without contributing to the body, or, or excuse me, who are contributing to the body by prayer and good deeds. And help the younger ones too, but steward the help so that you have the ability to help the truly needy and keep them all from being slandered. In the end, Paul is making clear the responsibilities of earthly families and the family of God. And he's showing us how to help the, those, to truly help those that God has placed in our purview and what, by who God has said is responsible. And even though this passage is tied situationally to it's written in the context of the church at Ephesus, it's still, it's kind of like the verse we read from James 1.27, true religion is taking care of widows and orphans. It, it applies, it's applicable to all believers, to all, to all generations of churches. And this is in line with our church here, with our mission of loving God by helping people follow Jesus, which we would be doing perfectly if we were in our vision joined together on this journey with Jesus as we pray, grow, give, and go. This is both helping to give and it's also helping to grow. So as we come to the table today, to the communion table, I think it's a good thing for us to ask ourselves, where am I relation in relation to these scriptures that have been taught today? Am I Christ indulgent? Am I self-indulgent? 
Actually, the, the, the better question to ask is this. Where in my life right now am I Christ indulgent? And where in my life right now am I self indulgent? Because that's where I'm winning, that where I'm Christ indulgent, I'm winning. Where I'm self indulgent, it's not just the people around me, but I'm losing. So I need to fight the good fight. I need to train in godliness. Do you remember what training in godliness is? It is a proper response to God. It's a proper response to God for what he's done for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. To be in his word. To talk back to him about what his word has said. To have that conversation with him. And then to go with that conversation out to live out that conversation. That's training in godliness. That's doing it every day in every way. And that's Christ indulgent. It's not letting things slip through the cracks. In uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. We'll go on a little bit more of this later. But I want you to think at that, at that table, at the, good, at, the, at the first communion, the last supper of the Passover with, with Jesus, there were, there were sinners there, right? There were sinners there. Can any, don't name them in your head. Can anybody name the sinners? You would be tempted to say Judas, and you would not be wrong. But you could name everybody but Jesus, and you would be right. And as you and I sit around this table so to speak, as we have our our communion in this way, as we sit around the table, we're coming together, we have all the important things in common, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And if there's somebody here today that doesn't have that in common, well, we've, we've told you the gospel, would you respond? Whosoever will may come. If you want to, you can come. You can pray right now and say, I admit my sins. Jesus, I believe that you are who you said you are, the only way to the Father. And I choose to repent of my sins and say, I don't want to go that way anymore. I want to make a U-turn and follow you. Take me and make me yours. And then you would have all things in common that are important with us as well. So, but as we look in our lives and we say, what is Christ indulgent? What is self-indulgent? How great would that be? You know, they have all this little software that, that is, and apps that are so wonderful. And, the, and everybody, the, the snap answer is, you know, well, can you do this? Can you do that? And somebody will always say, there's an app for that. You know, and I'd have my, son, my grandsons showing, putting up this uh, app that uh, Gordy gave me that I told you about before in our backyard. Lots of planes come across back there. But you don't see them till they're like right on you. So they held up the little thing and, and it showed um, if, if, just in the general direction. You didn't see a plane yet. But all of a sudden, a box would pop up and say, American Airlines 767 headed from Salt Lake City to Fresno. And it's this far out and this high. And you had someone, and they say, wow, Pop, I can't even see it. I said, well, watch it. In three minutes, you'll see it. And boom, there it is. And they're spotting helicopters and all those things. How great would it be if I could pull out my, my phone and, and I could hold it over and you could tell me, okay, you know, oh, look, I spotted a sin, Bob. Oh, if you don't change that landing pattern, something bad's going to happen in about three minutes. <laughs> right? But we kind of do. We have the Holy Spirit in us, and we have the Word of God. And we have God's church. If we're living in constant context with the local body of Christ, we have all that. That's, you know, some have called that God's GPS, God positioning system. Okay, and so we have that as we come to the table today, you know, Jesus sitting at a table full of sinners. Do you feel at home? And so you can bet that they thought about that at the time. And when Jesus, because when Jesus said, oh, one of you is going to betray me. They didn't use Peter's old speech. They could have pulled out Peter's old speech. It was so good where he said, not me, Lord. But they didn't use that. They put it away. And they said, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? 
And so understand, in that case was Judah, in this case it is all of us. As we pray, and we, before we take the bread, I want you to just spend a little time talking to the Lord. Is there anything that you need to agree with God about today? About either a lack of serving somebody like widows, or caring about hospitality, people different than you, okay? Or um, just not interested in, in uh, washing the feet of the saints. In other words, helping other brothers and sisters in Christ. What is it? This is not to point and say negative. It's to say, God, where can you change me from where I am self-indulgent to the life I always say I want to hit, live. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I always like to quote that verse. You know, Jesus said, I will give them life and give it abundantly. I want to have that abundant life. Well, abundant life is about keeping short accounts with God and saying, God, where do you want me to agree? And what do you want me to do as a result? So let's pray silently about that for just a little bit before we take the bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege to take communion together. What a gift it is to, that we are saved and know you. And what a, what a joy it is, if we understood it correctly, that you have put us in the lives of people that we may come in contact with who don't know you. That we could, we could help disciple those who do know you, and we can help call to discipleship those who don't know you. Lord, help us to take seriously why we are here. We don't know the days that we have here, but you do. And so you tell us, teach us to number our days. I, I understand that as help us to make use of the time we have and not take it for granted and not take you for granted. So today, we would just thank you for what you've done in our lives and what you are going to do. And we ask that you use us for your glory and the good of those that you've placed around us. In Jesus' name, amen. A knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. You are sent.